This is The Right Approach. I'm J.W. Judge, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Barbara Hinsky. This is a podcast for writers to learn more about the craft of writing as we explore a new topic every week. Our guest today is Karen Odin, who is the author of several Victorian-era mystery novels, including Down a Dark River, which has one of my favorite covers that I have seen in a while. Um, And with Barbara and Karen both living in Arizona, this is going to be a a, uh, Southwest-centric podcast today. Uh, So Karen, welcome to The Right Approach. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Okay. I want to start with a curveball, which is always a great way to start. So when Barbara and I do our, I was going to say solo, our duo podcast, where it's just the two of us, we start with a personal update where we talk about what we're working on. And some people like talking about like what they're working on and what they don't. And so if you're game for it, I thought we might just go around the table here and say, you know, what's going on with our writing projects or whether it's, you know, a publishing side or writing side. Are you up for that? Sure. Barbara, why don't you tell us where you're at? I know that you're kind of had just sort of finished one project. I don't know if you're still working on that and started at another. Where are you? So I just published the third book in my Emily series, Over Every Hurdle. It's out, doing well. I have barreled through and wrote the fourth book in the series and just got the line edit back. So I'll tackle that Thanksgiving week. Currently, I'm writing my ninth Rosemont book. Two years ago, I left a woman in labor. Um, and so now she's finally having those babies. I'm ashamed. <laughs> That That's happens. a really long gestation period. A long time. And the, um, you know how things in publishing just are silent for so long, it's crickets. And then all of a sudden, everything's a huge emergency standing on its head. So that's happened with the audio versions of um, the, the second and third books in my Guiding Emily series. They're published by Podium. So I've had a lot of deliverables to do for those, which makes me happy. So that's kind of what's keeping me um, out of trouble, I'd like to say out of the kitchen and on my diet. Well, not yet, but it's keeping me busy. So that's what I'm doing. Um, should we throw it to Karen and see what she's been? I know some of the stuff cause she's been like speaking at our local, she had a fabulous, um, talk at the poison pen bookstore, which is a big deal. It's probably the most prominent, um, mystery bookstore in the country maybe even in the world I don't know but uh, Karen was a guest there I couldn't go in person because I had car trouble that day but um, I watched her on zoom and she was charming and fabulous so I know she's done that what else are you up to I yeah I am I feel a little um, split these days because Under a Veiled Moon which is the second book in the Inspector Corvin series just came out on October 11th. And so I have been doing events here, there, and everywhere. The Poison Pen was in person, which was wonderful fun. I think that's my fourth um, my fourth launch there, which is great. They're always so supportive and wonderful. And I went to Wisconsin where I had an event at Boswell's and another one in um, at Mystery to Me, which is in Madison. And then I had a few book clubs to do, and I've been doing some writing workshops for the main publishers and writers and alliance. And so I've been I've been doing a lot of that marketing end of for Under a Veiled Moon, and um, and also I've been starting this new standalone that I'm working on. It's um, I'm completely excited about it. I kind of stumbled on a couple historical nuggets of things that because I've sort of mushed together and am and, and beginning to explore. But the story generally is about a young woman who, uh, a young Irish woman from County Armagh. And she leaves with her family during the potato famine and goes to Liverpool where she finds a position in the Dunstable house. And she's a maid and seamstress. And then she eventually moves down to London. And when her husband dies and she's left with her little son, she becomes a thief. And uh, she's very good at it and she does it for several years. And then finally she is caught and she's put on one of the transport ships to uh, what was called New Holland, which we we now call Australia. And she um, has to make a life for herself in this penal colony. 
And I've found a lot of nonfiction accounts about this that have been, I, I'm just completely absorbed by them right now. So that's, that's where I am. I'm just reading and scribbling notes furiously for that book. Wow. All right. Well, I'm, I'm going to tie into Ireland here um, because I'm writing my fourth novel, um, which starts in Birmingham and ends up in Sligo, Ireland, and we get it. It's a really, I'm going to say it's really weird. I don't know if it's a super weird book, but it's fantasy. Um, the premise is basically what if the tooth fairy were evil and was collecting everybody's bones because they had really bad intentions? Um, <laughs> and so that is all going to tie in to Queen Maeve 2000 years ago. Um, who supposedly was buried atop Nock Naray, uh near Sligo so that she could watch over her enemies even in the afterlife. And so um, I'm a, I just started the third act and in action stories, you know, and this is probably true in mystery too, is in, in the, the third act, something bad needs to set things off as you kind of get to that resolution and i was kind of struggling about what that was going to be because this whole story has been building and building but i didn't have a good sense of what was going to happen here as the catalyst to get us through to the end and then it just hit me like a lightning bolt and things fell into place after that and so now i'm going to try and sprint through the last you know fifteen thousand words here and get it done hopefully by the end of the year we'll see um and uh, so that's, that's where I'm at. I had my nonfiction book, Write Your Novel One Day at a Time, come out a couple of weeks ago, November 1st. As, so as we're recording this a couple of weeks ago, as this airs, it'll be in December. But um, and that's, you know, it's been good. Sales have been trickling in here and there, you know, several a week. So that's about what I expected. And we'll carry on. Sounds good. Birmingham is an interesting place to begin. Um, during I don't I don't know if you know this, but during the Victorian era, that was the center of the gun making industry for really all of England and and a good chunk of Europe. Um, they had that was their that was one of their big um, exports out of that out of that town, and they had all these canals that were like uh, like a little web where they could drop the guns into these boats and send them downstream and. Um, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting city. Um, I learned, uh, I learned a lot about it when I was doing some research for another book. Well, that is interesting. And I have to specify Birmingham, Alabama, because oh, Birmingham, that's Alabama. where I am. And so very <laughs> presumptuous of me, um, which is of course named after Birmingham, England, because we, uh, we're a steel town or at least we were. And so huh? that's, was very intentional in the naming so people would have right. that connection to it and have that connotation already so oh, i didn't uh, realize that that's it that, that's so interesting i was thinking birmingham england only because that's closer to sligo than birmingham alabama right. to sligo. <laughs> um yeah so when birmingham was founded in the uh, 16 six i'm sorry the 1860s early 1870s uh, they you know people came over obviously there were the indigenous folks who were certainly here for much longer, uh, but white people came and found that there's limestone and iron ore and something else that you need for steel. That's all of a sudden escaping me, um, man, I'm drawing a blank. Anyway, it's here in abundance. And so it just kind of sprang up overnight and people, we wanted to be known as a steel town. And so they settled on Birmingham because Birmingham, England was, already in an existence and known as a steel town for much longer. Um, you know, this is kind of one of the jumping off points for one of the things that I think is so fascinating about Karen. She is such a wealth of historical knowledge. And so, and she has an extremely impressive pedigree. So would, before she became a novelist, so would you like to tell us what your background is and and how that led into your writing career sure thanks for asking barbara i did my dissertation many years ago now 
at NYU on uh, in English literature, and I wrote on Victorian railway disasters, which is a weird little niche topic. And uh, you know, I, I became a little bit of a train geek for about five years, obsessed with trains and and accidents. And the reason I was interested in them was because what I came to understand is that what we now call PTSD, and which in World War One was called shell shock, and and in the 1890s Freud called it hysteria. Um, but before that, there was something called uh, railway spine or concussion of the spine, which which looks like PTSD. Um, I mean, Charles Dickens crawled out of a railway crash in 1865, and he um, he seemed fine. I, I mean, the entire train had fallen over on its side and he dragged himself and his mistress Ellen and her mother and his briefcase with our mutual friend out after him and he went around ministering to people um helping them he had some brandy or something with him and he was helping you know try and you know get people comfortable or or whatever he could do and then the tr um this happened in Kent uh, about 70 or 80 miles southeast of London, I believe. Anyway, the tr the, the train company sent a, another express train down, picks everybody up, takes everybody back to London. And then the next morning, Charles Dickens wakes up and he has the shakes. He can't sign his name. He has ringing in his ears. He develops um, mild paralysis and like tingling. He has nightmares that are so bad he won't go to bed. He falls asleep at his desk at night. And he dies five years to the day afterwards. And his son actually said, you know, my father never recovered from that railway crash. And, you know, no one really knew how to explain these origins of, you know, the origin of all these symptoms, because it didn't seem to be um, really biological. But under existing medical jurisprudence, you couldn't get money. You could sue the railway companies, but you could only get money if something was linked to an organ. It had to be organic, like as in a liver or a kidney or heart or, you know, broken leg or something. And so nerves didn't count. So um, anyway, I became really fascinated by this. And as a result of reading all these medical and legal and texts and the novels and poems and songs, and I mean, they were, I mean, they were everywhere. They were sort of a national obsession the way, I mean, maybe something like hacking is now. Um, a, a threat that people understood was there, but that we had to live with because everybody was riding on trains. And because I read around in all these different sort of historical categories um, and realized how um, the discourse that was circulating between the medical texts and legal texts and novels, I mean, they were, they were um, actually copying from each other almost. There was this web of language and explanation that sort of put together became the foundation for Freud's hysteria and later PTSD. Anyway, um, and so I became interested in not just the Victorian literature, but the history and the context. And so when I came around to writing my first book, uh, this was back in like 2008, I think I started 2006 or eight, somewhere in there. Uh, I wrote a young adult novel about a young woman in 1874. She and her mother get on a train and north in sort of the north part of London, and it goes off the rails. And there's this huge, terrible accident. And it turns out that it's a sabotage stock fraud scheme thing. But that was my first book. And then I ended up just staying in Victorian England for the rest of it. <laughs> well, that's, that is fascinating. And I'm going to let Jeremy field the next question, but I just want to make it clear because you're too modest to say. So that little dissertation, you have your PhD from where in what? Uh, NYU uh, English Literature. Yes. And and I ended up, you know, parlaying it into some really fun things. I got to teach at the University um, of Wisconsin in Milwaukee for a few years. That was that was fun. And I was an editor for Victorian Literature and Culture, which is an academic journal that probably only about you know, 20 people read, but it's a great, it's a great journal with, you know, fascinating articles about all kinds of history and literature. And I wrote some introductions for Barnes and Noble for their classic series for Dickens and Trollops and Victorian novels. So I got to do a lot with it. And then it ended up being a nice foundation for, you know, for all of all five of my books. Wow. <laughs> right. So I'm going to, I'm going to tie into this too, uh, while we're talking about trains is I was a history major and a history teacher before I went to law school and thought that I was going to go the whole, the PhD academia route and got my master's in history 
and wrote a thesis about the similarities in labor forces uh, for the folks who built the Trans Continental Railroad in the United States mm -hmm. and then the Trans Siberian Railway in Russia um, and also had a train obsession for a while as a result you of <laughs> yes. <Or> kindred spirits. <laughs> yes, for sure. Um, and you know, that history background, I think similar to your English literature and research background has had such a significant role in even the way that I write mm -hmm. fiction. I mean, it certainly affects the way that I practice law and have, have written, I've just been writing for years and years and years and i love incorporating the history as much as i can of places into what i'm writing about and trying to set the mood that is appropriate for i mean all mine are contemporary you know but the mood in ireland versus alabama or in germany or italy or greece or you know wherever something is set is so different and i I want to, like in my second novel, I set it in this small town in Germany that I really didn't know anything about. And I picked it because it's this small town in the Black Forest that isn't very well known. And then I started doing some research and found out that there was this infamous serial killer in the late 1950s from that town. And so that became a very significant part of the book. And so how do you use, you know, your research and your skills that you've obtained over a, you know, a career and incorporate that research and those kinds of, you know, things into the works that you're writing? Yeah, that's a great question. I feel that most of my, actually all of my books have been a melding of two things. And it's only now after my fifth one that I can kind of look back and reflect. I don't know whether that's the truth for all authors that they can, they have to get a few under their belt before they look back and think, oh, I've got a method <laughs> that I didn't even realize I was developing. But mine is to take a peculiar factoid that I find in Victorian England or some aspect of the culture. And I inevitably seem to combine it with some personal quest that I am on, uh, something that I'm trying to work out in my head or in my heart that I need, um, that, I, that I, I, and I work through it in my fiction. So for example, in, um, in A Trace of Deceit, which was my third book, it's about a young woman named Annabelle Rowe, who is a artist at the Slade School in London, which was, which was created in 1871, is the first place that women could actually study art seriously. Um, a very forward thinking man named Felix Slade decided he was going to chair, or he was going to endow three chairs, one at Oxford, one at Cambridge, and one at the university in London. And he insisted that women be allowed in on the same footing as men. And that wasn't done before this because people realized that the women would have to be in the room with the men and the nude statues that they were sketching for their anatomy classes. Anyway, so Annabelle Rowe is one of the first women in, in London to be at the Slade. And um, and she has an older brother named Edwin, who is a um, opium addict, an incredibly gifted painter and a forger. And he has done such a good job at it that he ends up, uh, you know, making his living at it. But then he gets caught and he's put in jail and he has just gotten out of jail. And um, he swears he's gone straight. Um, but then he is murdered and a priceless Francois Boucher painting is stolen from his studio. He was cleaning it for auction. And so the the aspect of Victorian England that I was working with was the, the art and auction world. And I worked at Christie's Auction House in New York in the, in the 1990s. So that was sort of my foundation for this. But I was fascinated by this world that, um, you know, these the, the paintings, the art, the sculpture, the fact that women were um, beginning to make inroads in, but were often having to do it under pseudonyms or effacing their first names, you know, being able using initials, that kind of thing. So I was interested in you know gender, art, all those kinds of things in the Victorian world. But the other thing I was working out in my personal life, and I feel like this is what adds heart to the book, is my father had passed away 
in 2012, and he was an extremely gifted musician. So when he was a child uh, growing up, he had um, two older brothers, uh, Jerry and Vic, and they were um, uh, very, you know, sort of um, athletic, and they were also very close in age and best friends. And they would go out and play football and rugby and all these other things. And my father, uh, born, I think, five or six years after that, um, he was smaller. Uh, he ended up being diagnosed with juvenile diabetes. He was not as athletic. And he was a, an extraordinary pianist. He had a perfect pitch. I think the story is that when he was two, he picked out Happy Birthday on the piano. And, um, but he, they, my grandparents only had three children. So my, you know, where Jerry and Vic were each other's best friends, the piano was my father's best friend. Hmm. And that, 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 that giftedness is a, is, is marvelous, but it can also, I think, pull family dynamics in some peculiar ways. Um, for example, my father was often trotted out to play piano for people when they came. I mean, it was, you know, entertainment. It was great, but I kind of began to wonder, well, how did Jerry and Vic feel about that? You know what I'm saying? So I was curious about giftedness and what, how it can sometimes create very strong triangles between like the two parents, one of whom wants to push the child, one of whom wants to make sure the other child, the child has a childhood and then the child itself, and then the other children who are kind of left out of that triangle. What does that do? And so in the aftermath of my father's passing, I, I think I wanted to explore that. And so those are the two pieces that came together for Trace of Deceit. And, you know, so kind of similarly, in Under Veiled Moon, this Princess Alice disaster was just was just crazy. Um, this small steamship that was making its way up the Thames in September of 1878. And it's this little wooden, you know, boat. And it gets rammed by a 900 ton metal hulled coal carrier. It breaks into three pieces, sinks immediately, 600 people thrown in, into the Thames. Most of them can't swim. Most of them drown. Um, so there was this factoid. But then the other thing that I was talking, uh, that I was kind of thinking about and obsessing about in a way was regret. Like, what do we do with regret? How does it, how do we live with it? What do we, you know, maybe this is me, you know, me being 56 years old and beginning to look back on my life and think about changes or, or things that maybe missteps that I made, but I'm interested in regret. I, I think that it can be really productive for us as long as we don't let the shame that often goes with it uh, shut us down. Um, but if we can kind of stay open hearted and listen to it and pay attention to it, it can be of use. And so I was really interested in those two things. So I put those two things together for this book. That is, I love hearing about other people's processes and how things come together Absolutely. because it's so different from my own experience that just everybody's brain mechanics are so different. That I just think that's incredibly interesting. So, you know, as you're learning about these different tragedies um, that are central to your writing or, you know, just about Victorian England generally, mm -hmm. there is so much more knowledge that you acquire than you can ever reasonably put into the book uh, yeah. because else it would not be a story anymore. Um, so uh, what part of the story do you kind of call that? Is that in the writing as you're going or is it something you dump a bunch of stuff in that you have to take out later? <laughs> uh, it, it's a messy process. I don't know whether you <laughs> feel that way too, but it's messy, right? Like, and some stuff, some stuff I, 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 I realize that I'm shoehorning in because I want to stick it in there. Cause it's a really cool fact. And oftentimes I have to pull those things out. And I had a hard time doing that, especially so for, with my first book, a lady in the smoke, of course I had years of railway trivia in my head as I'm trying to write this book. And it was also my first one. And that's the one where you make lots and lots of mistakes. Right. And uh, so there's this one guy, his name was Wharton Sinkler and he was a doctor. And so during the course of the whole process of people suing other people, suing the railways and the railways defending themselves and that sort of thing, these railway men um, would come into the court, these, all these different railway surgeons and doctors and all these people anyway. So the people who were sympathetic to the plight of these poor victims would say, oh, it's a true disease. And it's, it's the, you know, it's railway spine and it's this, that, and that. anyway. And then you had the people who were hired by the railway companies, the doctors who would come in and say they're malingering, they're lying to get money, you know, just 
the same kind of tort stuff that we all see now. And one of the doctors named Wharton Sinkler is a real person. He would come into the courtroom and he had a hot poker. And if people complained that they couldn't feel their left leg, he would poke them while they were sitting in the jury box, I mean, in, in the box and the witness box. And, and I thought, oh my God, this is a great fact. And I shoehorned it in, in like two or three different places in Lady of the Smoke. And I had to keep taking it out. It didn't belong, but I really wanted to include it. So what I ended up doing, somebody gave me a very wise piece of advice, which was whatever you can't include in your book and you really, really want to tell people about, write a blog, write a little blog post. And so I've started feeling more at ease, not getting some of the stuff into my books because I know I could use it elsewhere. Um, as long as I can share it somehow, even if it doesn't belong in the book, because, you know, there are some things that I've, I've, you know, on third or fourth pass, I'll read and I'll think, Karen, you're just wanting to tell people about this. This, this doesn't belong here. <laughs> and I take it. You know, this, uh, that is so fascinating to hear and your research abilities led you into a very clever way to search the agents that you queried. And we would be remiss not to have you share that because I just thought it was brilliant. So would you like to speak to that? Well, um, sure. I, I, thinking back to querying for a lady in the smoke, I, I, oh my gosh, my first, okay. So the first draft of it, which was then called the Viscount's daughter at the time. I queried perhaps 50 agents and pretty much got nothing back. I got a few polite, no, this isn't for us. Sorry, we have to pass kind of things. Most people didn't even bother to reply. This was back when we were still doing it by paper mail, you know, that you send in, you know, a query letter and some manuscript and then go out to your mailbox and hope that somebody was replying. And then after getting all of those rejections, I was about ready to give up on writing. And I really was, I mean, I thought, okay, I've got to find something else to do. This isn't this, I'm just not cut out for this. And a friend of mine said, no, you, what you need to do is get some help. So she said, can't, isn't there somebody out there like a freelance editor or somebody you can use? And so through another friend, another writer friend, I found someone and she was hugely helpful, uh, did a lot of um, kind of, she had a lot of great suggestions, one of which was, you know, right now your inciting incident, your railway disaster is happening at the end of chapter eight. It needs to happen at the end of chapter one. And I said, oh, but those first seven chapters are so wonderful and full of information and backstory. And she said, yeah. And she says, it belongs in your head as you're writing. It doesn't belong in your story. It needs to be feathered in later after the fact. It needs to influence your characters but it does not belong in your book. So anyway, so I chopped out those first seven chapters and and I followed a lot of her other advice and then sent out um, a bunch more queries. And the way that I found my agent, the agents that I was querying was I went to Publishers Marketplace, which is an enormous database full of um, uh, announcements, basically daily announcements of all of the books and the movie deals that are being made. And what's nice is it's clickable. So you can, you'll find, for example, a, you know, some historical mystery and you'll see it was, it's, you know, you'll see the author's name and you'll see the agent and you'll see um, the agency that the agent belongs to. And you'll see the editor, the acquiring editor and the publishing house. And all of this is you can click on everything and get all this information. And so I went online and I started basically scrolling through and looking for historical mysteries. And um, anybody who had a, you know, anytime I saw a historical mystery, I made a note of the agent and the editor. And a couple of them were, uh, you know, a couple of them I started seeing repeats, you know, as, as you do because I was, mm -hmm. I was kind of going back through and I sent out 12 queries and these were very directed queries. I spent some time writing them with that opening paragraph being something along the lines of responding to something in, for example, on their website or saying, hey, I've read these two authors that you represent and I write things like them, that kind of, that kind of directed query. And out of the 12, I got, I think it was six people wrote back saying, oh, I'll take a look at something. 
which was huge. I mean, way better odds than I had been led to expect. And eventually I ended up getting two offers of representation and I went with Josh Getzler of HG Literary. And he was, he had just moved over to um, uh, HSG in New York. And um, he was just, you know, just beginning to build his list. And he was really excited about, about my railway story. How That's has, fair. oh, go ahead, Barbara. No, 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 no. Take it. Um, all right. So how has that, are you still with him? Like, mm -hmm. okay. So how has that relationship grown? Um, and how do you, do you use him during the course of your writing or is it you send it when it's done and, you know, what does that relationship look like for y'all? You know, it's, it's evolved in the way that a, you know, a long-term friendship kind of evolves I mean and or any relationship um what I tend to do is talk I usually like if I have an idea for a book like this new book this new standalone that I have I'm uh I call you know we we have sort of a one-hour conversation where we talk about you know I, okay how is under veil moon doing how is how are things going with crooked lane and then we kind of move into okay well what do you want to do next and I share some ideas and um, we talk about possible editors who might be interested, that kind of thing. And oftentimes I'll give him a two to three page sort of synopsis overview of the characters, the plot, the themes, the character arc. And, you know, and, you know, sort of give that to him. Sometimes he'll send back, hey, you might want to think about this. You might want to think about that. And that does help direct my writing. So there, there is some exchange. I know some people work very intensely with their agent. Um, I don't. I tend to try and get at least something together before I, um, and then other people are like, well, no, I just send it to him when it's finished. And and um, we have we have more than that. I think the thing that's been really wonderful with Josh is that, um, we are able to sort of go meta on what we need from each other. And for example, one time, uh, I contacted him and I didn't hear back and I didn't hear back. And I finally wrote to him and said, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm trying to reach you. And he said, you know, um, you know, I'm so sorry. I can't, I haven't gotten to this. He said, but one thing I want to just, you know, kind of give you a heads up about is, you know, if you've got something that is timely, please CC John, my assistant, because he will make sure that I get to it. He'll keep track of that schedule and make sure that I get to it on time. And so we were able to like, okay, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's like, you know, relationships with friends or even your spouse or your partner or whatever, because you have to recognize like, oh, when I say this, this is what I mean. And oh, this is what I need from you in order to you know, you sort of work out a code. And I think that that's one of the things that we've developed over the years that has been really wonderful. I mean, I, you know, I, I appreciate his guidance, his feedback. He has been a wonderful advocate for me. And there have been times when um, he's had to go to bat for me for various things and he does it. And, um, you know, they're, they're, you know, very various situations. There's one situation where um, we had uh, an issue with the cover of one of the books in which something was 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 not accurate, historically accurate. And I said, like, this is I, you know, this is a problem. And he, you know, he presented it and um, got some resistance and pushed back again, and it it ended up working out and being right. So, um, you know, I think, I think that, I, I think that our relationship has, um, evolved and, and it's really positive and encouraging, um, you know, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I feel lucky that with what I have. Yeah. And, and that sounds great. And we have just recorded a couple of episodes with Barbara's writing coach that she uses, and it sounds like a very, I similar relationship in many ways in the feedback that's provided i have my first three novels that i've written and then before that my two law practice books that i had self-published mm -hmm. and it was a business decision and i, I made it for <laughs> because i like to have control over things frankly um 
And, but for this fourth one, I have considered, you know, do I want to query an agent? Do I want to go a different route and see what that looks like? And have even like looked a few times and put some effort into it. And ultimately I keep coming back to, I think I'm just going to do it myself because I don't have the patience for that process. And, you know, I admire the people who do and I don't know if that would be a better route for me, but it's just like, I know that I can do this entire thing on my own. It, mm -hmm. may, it may make the journey, I mean, it certainly will make it different. It's going to make it different finding readers and, you know, doing all that myself. And so I'm having a hard time forcing myself to cons strongly consider other options, but stories like yours of somebody there going to bat for you, putting it in front of potential buyers, um, you know, it causes me to think about, do I want to proceed down the route that I'm on or do I want to consider something else? So I think that that's something that a lot of authors, you know, it's, it's a business decision about which way you want to go. And just because you do it doesn't mean you're stuck with it and you can always look at it for every new project. So I think that that's really an encouraging account of how things have gone for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, it's interesting. I, I guess it was a, a couple of months ago, I did a workshop on building your community of practice. And um, I, it, this kind of came out of a, a grant that I won. It was an Arizona Commission on the Arts uh, put out, they get, they give a research and development grant and I won it a couple of years ago. And one of the questions on the application was what, how will this affect your community of practice? How do you engage with your community of practice? And, you know, as a writer, paradoxically, I think, we, you know, we're so alone at our desk. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got our characters in our setting and we're immersed and we're in our world and whatever world that is. And yet we are so, we, our community of practice is enormous because it's, it's booksellers, bloggers, reviewers, readers, agent, editor, beta readers, and, and I mean, all of these people in our writing and reading communities. And I think, you know, one of the things that I've had to learn over the past few years is to interact mindfully with that whole community, um, you know, to, to consider um, what I can give back and what I am getting from, you know, from everyone, from, I mean, Sisters in Crime, um, you know, Desert Sleuths, uh, Mystery Writers of America, and, and you know, all these you know, the, the whole, the whole huge community and you know, the conference goers, the readers, the people who contact me from Tulsa, Oklahoma and say, Hey, can you do a writing workshop for us? Kind of thing. I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot. And I think I've been very um, gratified to find so many people that I can exchange work with people who I, you know, I, I, I read and review other people's books. They read and review mine in the, in the development process. And um, I don't think my writing would be where it is now if I didn't have a, a, a stable of four or five beta readers that read everything I write before it even goes to my agent and before he even has anything to say about it, um, you know, long before the editor gets a hold of it. And so I feel... I feel deeply appreciative. And, and it was funny because I, I commented to someone recently something about beta readers and they said, oh, I don't use beta readers. I've never asked anyone. And I thought, wow, I, I would feel like I was writing in a void without them. And, and I realized that the model for this beta reading thing comes from graduate school. This is another one of those benefits that you realize afterwards, because when I was working on my dissertation, my advisor, uh, a professor named Mary Poovey would invite we had, she was, she was supervising six different dissertations. And so each week, one of us would prevent 20 to 20, present 20 to 25 pages, you know, one of our chapters to the group. And so in effect, I was, I was building this model of five beta readers um, from very, very early on. And I, 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 I don't know, I find it works for me. I find it really helps. I, read a book several years ago called Bandersnatch. And it's about C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien and the other members of their writing group, the Inklings, who met, I think it was every Thursday night for years. I mean, it may have been decades 
um, and read each other's work and critiqued each other's work. And there's this idea that, you know, these authors back then were these solitary, you know, monoliths and didn't get feedback, but it's not true. And right. they relied yeah. on each other heavily. And, you know, when you read, and this was by, it, it's kind of an academic book, but it was also incredibly interesting. Um, you can see how it affected the works that they wrote and and caused their writing to evolve. And so that, you know, structure has existed for a long time now and people need to be willing to put themselves out there, whether it's with other writers, whether it's with readers to get that feedback, to make your writing better and more successful. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that about, I knew that C.S. Lewis and Tolkien had, had corresponded. I didn't realize that there was a group called the, they were called the Inklings. Yeah. That's wonderful. I love that. Yeah, It's a great name. <laughs> yeah. um, and it was, you know, it was hugely influential for these men who were a part of it for years. Uh, and mm -hmm. it was, it's just really encouraging. And the whole book is about the idea of collaborating and creative mm -hmm. collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, just really inspiring. Uh, so I think that that's a great place for us to bring the interview to a close but before we do that, I want to make sure people know where to find you, follow you, and purchase your books. Thank you. Yeah, so I have a website. It's easy. It's www.karenodden. It's K-A-R-E-N-O-D-D-E-N, is in Nancy.com. And there you can connect with me, contact me. Uh, I have, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and I also have a newsletter that comes out every six weeks. It's, I don't believe in clogging people's inbox. We all have way too much email as it is, but this newsletter, I began during the pandemic and part of it was a way of reaching out to readers on a sort of regular basis. But I also, each, S, each one includes an essay and a giveaway by another woman writer. And this is just my way of sort of giving back to my women writing community. This, the most recent one came out two days ago or yesterday, yesterday, I guess it was, it was yesterday. And it features Mariah Fredericks, who has just written a book called The Lindbergh Nanny, which is getting wonderful reviews. And people can um, sign up and uh, register for the giveaway. Um, and so they, they get a uh, signed first edition copy of the book. So, but- Well, that's um, really yeah. cool. I mean, yeah. I love to hear stories of writers helping other writers and, you know, using your own platform to promote others because writing books isn't a zero sum game. Um, mm -hmm. The more people read, the more they are likely to read. And so the more yes. we can advocate for others, um, the better it is for each and every one of us. So I, I really love that. Thanks. Well, thank you for your time. Uh, I really enjoyed the conversation and yeah. uh, we look forward to keeping up with you. Thank yeah. you so much. I appreciate being here. Yeah, thank you.